Hi, this is Art of Storytelling on the web, so I'm going to keep keep all the questions and comments as close to the writing aspect of this as possible. Uh, everyone up here has written or supervised the writing of online content. Uh, I'm going to give the briefest of intros of everybody up here now, then we're going to see the clips, then we're going to all come back and start getting into it. All right. You know me, maybe you know me, I don't know. Uh, I've got like a 20-year career, mostly writing, genre, sci-fi series, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, Battlestar Galactica, Torchwood, Game of Thrones, now Once Upon a Time, Sunday on ABC. Uh, and I am the co-writer and co-creator of Husbands. Now, let's see, who else do we have here? We have Mr. Anthony Zyker, who needs no introduction, like seriously, because he created CSI and all the wonderful CSI satellites. Um, he is a pioneer of cross-platform storytelling, including the Digi novel, and he's the executive producer of Cybergeddon, which is a critically praised uh, series that we are going to see some of today. Uh, we have Brad Bell, who is consulting producer on VH1's pop-up video. He is a YouTube sensation with his one-man comedy videos, and he is my co-creator and co-writer on Husbands, and he's also the co-writer with me of the Husbands digital comic books that are going to be coming out. We also have Erica Oyama, who is the writer for the Emmy Award-winning Adult Swim series Children's Hospital. She spent three seasons on the online show Wainy Days and is the sole writer of Burning Love, a satire of The Bachelor, which we're going to see also. Um, fantastic. So funny. And finally, we have Dennis Leone, who's the creator of Resurrection Boulevard, the first and longest-running Latino dramatic series on US TV. He is the writer and director of Los Americans, uh, starring Isai Morales, who is on Caprica, uh, and who is awesome. And we're going to see some of that, too. I love that we've got a traditional sitcom, we've got a drama, family drama, we've got satire, and we've got, like, thriller, high-tech action, female-centered thriller, high-tech action. Um, like, just um, what the web has become is television. And I think we can all agree that, like, that you can't see the difference anymore. I have questions for each of you specific to your show. I want to start with you, Eric, Erica. <laughs> um, something, if you watch Burning Love, which everybody should do, because it's absolutely fantastic, uh, one of the things that you'll see is when they do the previously, they have, they include jokes and bits that aren't in the previous episode that you saw, which is fantastic. And it also makes clear that there must have been a lot of material that got cut, which makes me think, and also you've got a lot of actors in there who are really good at improv, which makes me think you probably had a lot of improv going on. Can you speak to that? We did. We, we shot the script first, and then we would go off and spend some time doing some improv. And it wasn't just the previously on, but or the next time on, but it was scattered throughout the series. Mm -hmm. We were able, we actually delivered a lot more content than we were supposed to, which was a good thing. Did you have story whole storylines that got cut? Um, no, well, there's like, there's maybe a bit or two that didn't make it in the series, but everything was planned out, mapped out, yeah, scripted. It was, it was really extraordinary. The, the, and Ben Stiller was involved in the creation of it because he appears... His company, Red Hour, produced it, um, and then when everything started going, he was like, I'll do a cameo. We're like, sure, Ben Stiller, can do a cameo <laughs> for our web series. It's really, really good. Thank you. And Dennis, I wanted to ask you about um, doing content with a social conscience, about like the reason that you made the show, I assume, had you had a, st you had a thing you wanted to come across, a reason you wanted to tell this story. Well... <laughs> Um, when you say social conscience, you know, it's, it's sort of, I don't know, it's, I'm very political anyway by nature, and uh, so I try to shy away from that because it's hard to balance entertainment with that because then you start, you know, things start becoming didactic and, you know, and that's, that's the death knell. Um, but, you know, obviously, I, and the funny thing is, is I worked like on five different shows before I even wrote a Latino character. And then all of a sudden, I am like, you know, I got to write Latino characters. So, you know, in that regard, it's, you know, trying to trying to do diversity things and all of that. And so then, you know, then I got to carry that banner. And that's kind of, I don't like doing that, really. I mean, I do it because, I, I mean, I want to do it, but I hate doing it. <laughs> um, 
But, you know, as far as the social stuff, I mean, Los Americans was done for a company called One Economy, which is this pro-social organization out of Washington, D.C., and, and Robert Townsend uh, came to me and said, we want to do a show, and, and it's on um, uh, PIC.TV, which is Public Information Channel, and uh, they do shows that you do these shows with all of these issues, and then you go to the corresponding web page, and if your family is dealing with alcoholism or childhood obesity or immigration issues and all that, you can click on the little links and your family can get help. And they have another show called a Diary of Single Mom, so it deals with all the problems of single mothers and all of that. So I don't know how I get stuck with, you know, I, wa I just want to do like some action thing like Anthony, you know, where you <laughs> just blow the shit up out of everything. <laughs> That's all stock footage. <laughs> have some, have some fun. <laughs> well, I've had a different question for Brad, but now I want I want Brad to follow up with this one about about social conscience because uh, obviously in in husbands we were dealing with we set it in a world where marriage equality uh, is the law of the land and used that as a starting place and was sort of an idea of seeing this couple for a reason. Um, how do you feel, cheeks about Brad about balancing social content and and comedy? Well, it's a challenge, for sure. Uh, I don't think it's impossible, but I think that it, it does take um, uh, a lot of uh, careful refinement and and uh, objective criticism of your own work. Um, and I think that working in comedy certainly makes it a lot easier than it does working in drama, because you can be absurd, you can be... Uh, satirical, you know, if you look at South Park, I don't think like South Park has ever been didactic, uh, and yet it's a very, very biting criticism of culture and politics. And so I, I think, you know, taking a page out of the Norman Lear book and uh, and progressing equality and, and a social awareness uh, at the same time that you progress the medium. You know, when we launched Husbands in 2011, uh, mm -hmm. September, there wasn't a show online or on television that featured a, a gay couple as the central characters. So I think that uh, in doing so, we've we've really pushed the medium forward and, and social awareness and, uh, yeah, the industry. If you had to choose between making a statement and being funny. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. I think there's a danger in thinking that you can only do one or the other, but I don't know. I don't know because if you're if you're gonna just be funny, then you might uh, be making a really bad statement. So I guess I'd have to say making a statement. <laughs> cool, Anthony, you're sort of the prophet of new directions in content, like the the digital novels and and this, which isn't just a series. It's a it's a game. It's a whole bunch of stuff at once. Um, can you? What do you think is the next thing? Or well, first, I guess, explain how all the different pieces of these projects fit together, and then what do, where, where are we headed? Sure. I, I mean, I just want to say that I'm just I'm so happy to be here. I mean, that, that was some really, really great content. That stuff that you wrote, I mean, I'm just, I think I cried five times in the corner, so I need to like, compose myself. <laughs> that was such beautiful writing. I can't wait to watch the whole series. Yeah. Um, Bring Love's hilarious. The naked chick was hilarious. It's like, ah! <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I didn't know husbands, that's awesome. So, um, well... I mean, look, I, I think for me, I just, I don't like the studio or the network system at all. There, I said it. So um, I don't like the way it works. I don't like the way they tell me what to do. I just don't like it. So, you know, for me, it was like, you know, I, I've already done well on CSI, so I'm done with all that stuff, and I'm going to just do online stuff now, for the most part. Though I still have a deal with ABC. Shh. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I wanted to do a movie that, went, that bypassed the theater, because I really do believe that the future of content will not be in theaters or television for the most part. Over the next five to ten years, it will all be online. That's my opinion. Therefore, we have a lot more writing to do if that's the case in terms of scale. Uh, and we launched an app, and we got involved in Yahoo, did a whole social interactive site. So we, we launched major initiatives going forward to really from the from this first stake in the ground of, in terms of scripted drama, trying to change behavior that's inevitably changing anyway, just trying to be in, in front of it, win or lose. And it's gonna take just film by film, show by show to change behaviors, and that's what we're doing. As you've taken it into different dimensions, like you've taken it into the printed page and the game and the the scripted content, which obviously we visual medium, is there anything else? Is there anything where, like, are we going to get to 
like the brave new world of going to the movie theater and putting your hands on the seat and you can feel what's happening to the actors. Like, what, what dimensions left are left? I, I think if TV and movie, movies are to sustain in the industry, they'll have to resort to something that's fashion forward in terms of technology shift. I mean, you know, everybody here probably has a phone and an iPad and tablet and that kind of thing. Um, so for me, it, it's just about, it's about I, the theaters will have to adapt. Uh, well, there's so much they can really do in terms of interactivity when you're at the theater and television. You know, as the small screen goes into the living room more and more because of the computer, that'll probably help some. But I think the the, the percentage of consumption throughout our devices will really shift towards that's how we're consuming things. Period. Mm -hmm. and, and movies will just be a luxury to go to, or kind of like a coffee bar or a cigar bar. Mm -hmm. um, and television will be you know less and less TV shows and probably more and more content online. Mm -hmm. And probably scheduled program will feel super archaic in five years. It just seems odd that I would watch something at eight o'clock on a Thursday. Yeah, doesn't like it? Like the radio, already? it's like I don't, don't want to watch that. Listen to that song until another song comes on. It's just archaic to me personally. Mm -hmm. I think that'll all change drastically. It's already changed a lot two years earlier than what it is today. Yeah, actually, just uh, I noticed everybody's episodes are, are no longer the two-minute episodes that people were doing. Just season one of Husbands, we had two-minute episodes because that was how people were consuming that content. Now everybody's at 10 minutes, uh, and it seems like that will probably continue to change, and we, these will just become the way you watch a normal-length TV show. Um, Super tough. I'm not sure we, we've all perfectly figured it out because sometimes it's a good case. I, mean, I want to do 90 minute, 90 second episodes every day, every single day. Uh, just hardcore cliffhangers, just like grab your throat just for the lunch hour and watch it quickly. Mm -hmm. But then again, a shared 10 minute thing. If I get something that's 10 minutes long from a, from a friend, I'm not watching it. Right. That's too long. Yeah, you know, I know exactly what you mean. It. I yeah. think it's com for comedy, it's easier to do for sure. like the shorter. No yeah. You know, I mean, we because in drama you have so much setup and you're yeah. you know. Yeah, beautiful but, uh, speech like you did there. You don't want to cut that up. Yeah, yeah, you well. got That's got to play in its entirety. It was lovely. Oh, um, uh, and also, we're we're waiting for Los Americans the video game. It's going to be. <laughs> it's going to be a seller. So what are we? What are we to call these things? Web series is starting to feel to me like it. it it got associated with the very early attempts where we didn't have the tech now where we could make it look as good as a TV show. Should we just call this all TV? I know, Brad, you have thoughts on this. I, I think we should. I think, yes, the term web series is sort of like saying, uh, I'm in a band or check out my demo. You know, it's like, <laughs> oh, I bet it's great. <laughs> and they might be a perfectly good musician, but it's there's so many not perfectly good musicians <laughs> that it, it becomes associated with like, oh, I'll, I'll have to do that when I get time. <laughs> um, and I think that, you know, when you look at the definition of television, it's it's defined as a telecommunication medium which is not uh, what the box in your living room is. That's, that's a broadcast box. It goes one way, which is not communication. Uh, and television means far vision. It means to take an image and project it over a great length and have it appear somewhere else. So I think that really the Internet, online content, is the uh, evolution and maybe the final realization of television. So I, I think that... Because it goes internationally, you mean, so it go it actually goes further. Exactly, yeah. because, you know, y you've got something airing at 8 o'clock on Thursdays on NBC, and it goes to New York from, from Los Angeles, but it, it doesn't reach Rome, it doesn't reach Hong Kong, uh, which you can do within minutes on YouTube. So... I mean, looking at it that way and the etymology of the word and, and the idea uh, around how it is defined, I think it's all television. So and should I think we just say these are these are TV shows? You can watch this TV show at right. husbands.com. Like, actually, on the way over here, I heard uh, a radio ad say something, the best new comedy on broadcast television. And I thought, well, there you go. There's a distinction. Broadcast television, cable television, web television. Um, yeah, and I think that give it some time, five, ten years, it'll be uh, the same way we remember when you couldn't take your phone everywhere with you. You know, the idea that your phone was this, this device in your house, and that was it. You didn't take it with you. I think television will be remembered that way. You know, it was, it was locked to the living room. You couldn't take television with you on your, on your iPad or whatever it'll be. See, yeah, but I, I re remember it used to be because um, I remember, like other showrunners and friends of mine who were executive producers, they, you know, we would all make the distinction between um, broadcast television and cable, and you know, it was like everybody would make fun of the people going off and working cable. It used to be that way, mm -hmm. and now, obviously, cable 
has taken over, and all of the good, sh all of the best shows, I think, are on cable, and uh, you know, broadcast television is sort of taking a, you know, a backseat to it, and uh, I think that's what's going to happen with the web. Right. The web will take over, and then, um, uh, you know, that's that's it's just it's a a, throughout history. It's, you're exactly right. It's the same exact pattern. Like those who laugh at that end up getting taken over every single time. I remember doing CSI, people, actors would be like, you know, uh, I don't do TV. We don't do TV. Right. See, it's a CSI. I don't do TV. And the next thing you know, like they all came in droves. Dennis Quaid in Vegas. I mean, they're everywhere now. So, you know, I, I think they get rid of infestation. Them, you know. yeah. But you're right. Web series sounds like like sort of like a used car connotation. Mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah. But I, I think that there will be a time, probably in the next three to five years, where that's where it's at. Period. Well, I yeah. think it's a, it's it's part of it is the monetization of it. You know, as soon as there'll be big money in the web, right. then all of a sudden it would be, oh, you know, then all the feature people will be flocking to it. Right. I mean, they are right. to some degree now, but. Did, did, so the the lack of money, the other, the money seems to still be less in the online. Did all of you feel like except you for Anthony's show? I mean, yeah. we saw the yeah, production that values like on that show. <laughs> <laughs> well, but did, did all of us feel that we had? I to can't talk numbers. <laughs> yeah, we're not talking numbers, but but in general, did all of us feel that we had to downsize a little bit in maybe ways that ended up feeling like, uh, gee, why were we spending all this money all this time and big TV when we managed to by by having to economize, maybe finding some genius along the way? I don't know. Anthony, you were nodding at the downsizing. Well, no, the thing is this: that we we work in a super wasteful business. So much money is left on the cutting room floor. Mm -hmm. They throw so much money to fix problems of things that just simply don't work. It's a wasteful business. They should be repurposing pilots on television that don't go. Like everything just goes on a shelf and just. So for us, you know, for Cybergeddon, it was all about you're not getting an upfront check. Don't ask for it. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a minimal back end. You're not doing this for a paycheck. Mm -hmm. You're doing this because you're an artist. Everybody's taking a cut and pay. Mm -hmm. We're putting every single thing on the screen, including the water bottle. Mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. and you just kind of just band up and you just make the best movie you can for that little price point and try to wow people and we found out that we can do I mean that looks really really good that looks amazing what our budget was um, and that just proves to the industry that we can do really great quality stuff at 95 minutes for the cost of what we, we do half of a CSI episode half that budget um, which is a good stretch for the dollar and right that that's says a, sends a message to the industry that we can do it better and way cheaper and we have to set the tone for that going forward. Yeah, Erica, you, yours looks just like The Bachelor. It looks like the it, same house. Thank same. you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> how, how, how did you achieve that? Was it, was it that The Bachelor is actually made very cheaply? Well, I think that helped, or the, the idea of it looking like a reality show. Not everything had to be perfect. It was like we could just catch things. Things didn't have to look as glossy as a you know, single camera show. But um, yeah, we shot, it, it was very daunting, the, the page count that we shot, and then we did the improv on top of that. And, but we, we shot the whole series in about nine days, and so we just had everybody show up and... Oh my God. How many minutes is the whole series total? Because it felt... It's almost two it. hours, I think. Wow. Or, That's yeah. amazing you got that shot in that amount of time. It was a lot of fun, but it was also really stressful and crazy and... <laughs> So did you shoot all the rose ceremonies? One day was just rose hose ceremonies. Hose ceremonies, yeah, because <laughs> he's a fireman, so he has hose ceremonies. But yeah, we had that was kind of a crazy day because it was right in the middle of pilot season, so we had you know actresses having to leave for different things, so we would have to cheat. You know, this person is there, and it kind of led to some some creative, funny solutions. Like the girl with no pants, Natasha Legero, mm -hmm. who's very funny. Um, she couldn't be there for part of the day, so we just had the host step in for her at one point, and then we isolated her during a different one. She was like asleep on the floor. Right. So some of that helped the creative process, I think. Yeah, isn't that interesting? You put a limitation on it, and it ends up making it better. I don't. Uh, do Do you, Dennis or Brad? Do you have a, a recollection of something like that um specific no <laughs> no not specifically it only, only made it worse I, I do agree no i agree that in general it it um you have to get more creative and nobody likes to put limits on themselves nobody says no please don't give me fifty thousand more dollars because i want to be creative uh, but i i do think that when faced with a challenge you have to you have well, to get creative, and it helps. Well, when you start always. limiting like locations and things, and you start, you know, like we spent, uh, we we were like a twenty-one day shoot, and we shot eight episodes, and uh, we spent 
every day but four days in the in a house, one house. And so, you know, as I directed it too, and it was like, okay, how many ways can I shoot this kitchen? Right. And you know, it's like you you want to go someplace else, and yeah. So that's that's. Yeah, well, yeah, and you, then you get creative ways to shoot the kitchen. Yeah, we had a similar thing. We shot everything for husbands in that one house, including the green screen stuff that we set a green screen in the backyard, except for the shots you saw of Joss Whedon in a corporate office. And we went, that was one day that we went out of our house. But the fact that, yeah, exactly, that we had to make everything work in that house uh, probably led to much better things than if we had gone, oh, we'll go to Dodger Stadium. No, we'll do a green screen of Dodger Stadium. And then we can really concentrate on the performances because we aren't going to be racing off to the next location, so, yeah. Um, uh, and were there time, okay, so what were, so those are limitations that made it better. Um, were there ever times that you missed the structure? Like, I think you're probably gonna say no, it missed the structure of having executives. Of having, no. <laughs> of having anyone there to, to be a backstop and say, oh, you forgot it. I mean, I, I, look, uh, it comes down to need, you know, in terms of just, I feel like as an artist, you have to at some point do something for yourself that doesn't include everybody up your ass. <laughs> That's just my philosophy. It's like enough is enough. So as an artist, like, I just want to do this. Leave me alone. Give me the money to do it. Get out of here. I'll show it to you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's all I want to do. Just that. You know, and, and, and if I just I told my, my, my company all the time, I tell them, the second we can make money off of doing this, mm -hmm. autonomous artistry, ownership and everything we, we call all the shots mm -hmm. with trusted people that love us. Adios. Just, when you figure that out, it, 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 everything will change in the company for well, us. Well, then why not uh, just say, oh, then we'll throw out all of, all of the TV tropes. Like, make an episode of any length and, and make, instead of digitizing that girl, she's just got it all flapping out in the world. Like, I, uh, why do we adhere to some of what we've inherited from traditional TV? Uh, Brad, I know you... Uh, yeah, I think there's... Um, I don't think executives are necessarily uh, all bad all the time. I think that a lot of good things come out of network notes, whether or not you want to admit um, that sometimes they were right. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that with an eye for that, you know, w thinking like a producer in your writing and paying attention to things like your budget and, well, we can't write this scene in an airport because it's going to cost too much. Let's figure out a more interesting way to have this take place in, you know, a closet or something. Um, I have the perfect closet in mind. Uh, I think uh, that structuring things in a familiar way, in a way that works, you know, the sitcom, for example, we decided to structure that in three acts um, because that is a classic formula that has worked. I think that the audience is used to that. And I think that that's the time that it should play out. I think that, uh, again, with the limits, you know, no, this doesn't exceed 24 pages. I know it would be great if this sequence went on and on because it's so funny to 32 pages, but let's put some some structure uh, into our work and limit ourselves and what we can do and make sure that every word counts, make sure that this is as funny as it can be in the amount of time we are giving ourselves. Uh, I, I just think it helps the, the work and it, it might help legitimize as well, you know, when we're still in this new era of- uh, It looks like TV. Creating content, exactly. It sounds like, I think you may, guys may not be in disagreement because it sort of sounds like you're saying, I don't need the executives to give me notes, and you're saying, because I can give myself right. those notes. Exactly. Yeah, I think uh, it's. In, in defense of the executives, uh, it, there is, there is a, a purpose to what they do, and they do know what they're doing a lot of the time, not all of the time. <laughs> um, and I think that as a creator, as a creative person, artistic freedom can be a dangerous thing. Uh, because not everyone has the ability to track their audience and to know what is essential and what's not. Um, you know, some artists just sit there and do what they think is hilarious the whole time, and the audience is is suffering. So, Dennis, you spent a lot of time in TV before you did uh, Los Americans. Did you, you? You, I assume, you were applying everything that you had learned all those years. <laughs> I've learned nothing. <laughs> the. Um, <laughs> You know, to, just to speak to the network note thing, I mean, it, it, people, it, you know, I've been accused of being arrogant, but I'm s at least smart enough to know that, you know, if somebody gives me something like a good idea, you know, I'll take ideas from anywhere. And, uh, you know, you Including gotta, you know, an executive. You listen to everybody. That doesn't mean, you know, <laughs> you get to the point where, yeah, I'll take notes. I don't take dictation. But, right. 
you know, you, you want to you wanna do that. But um, uh, it was hard making the transition, I think, from a one-hour drama to doing these because, you know, you have four acts. Actually, now the six structure six acts. Yeah. And, you know, trying to do it in, you know, 15 minutes is where you you want to feel like you're doing three acts, mm -hmm. you know, beginning, middle, and end. And, and uh, it was it was tough for me to try to fit it. And, it, and then it becomes like hyper-reality because, you know, in the first episode, it's uh, alcoholism, and then we're dealing with uh, childhood obesity, and um, the husband moves in who doesn't have a job, and so we're dealing with joblessness and homelessness, and then, we, and then um, the neighbor moves across, or you're dealing with uh, infidelity, and then, you, I mean, we just like race through these things, and it was like, whoa, this doesn't feel like network television, but it, you know, we, we managed to like cram everything in there, but... Um, well, we used to so say I, I don't know. I don't know if that answers your. It doesn't really answer your question, but but it's fascinating. I didn't. <laughs> so just that goes to show you, I haven't learned anything. <laughs> uh, you know, you've all now since it all goes out on, there on the web, we all get a lot, or it feels like we get a lot more direct viewer response. I mean, obviously, people can tweet at me about an episode of Once Upon a Time just as much as they can about an episode of Husbands, but there's something that feels different about the viewer reaction, don't you think? Like it's immediate. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you can put an episode up and immediately know what everyone thought of it. And the crazy thing that happened with Burning Love was Yahoo honored our wish to sort of treat it like a real reality show, like The Bachelor. And so they advertised it as the most romantic web series ever. And so people thought, a lot of people thought it was real, even though we had like these <laughs> people in it. People were like, this guy is so stupid. Why are these girls like trying so hard to get this guy? And it was oh like, my God. people get into fights on the message board. <laughs> that was really entertaining to watch and also depressing. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's the problem with reality television. You know, people don't know what's real and what's not real. Which I love so much. Well, yeah, that's true. I'm sure that, that there are storylines constructed by the the writer editors at The Bachelor that where they are pulling the strings just as not perhaps just as much as you were. They're not writing every word of dialogue, but they're writing some. Yeah, so there that's definitely mm. some manipulation going. Or yeah, some creative yeah. editing. Yeah, fascinating. Okay, I don't want to. This is so much fun, but I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to, to ask. And if we, if we have any lull, I'll jump back in because I got, I got a lot more questions for you guys. But if there are any questions from the audience, your hand up went up first. Yeah, I don't understand the breaking it into three acts. Each episode is how many minutes? How are you breaking it into acts? It's not, it's not really acts, but just so you, that you have like, you know, your beginning, you know, you, you, you have your beginning and middle and end to everything so that every episode some seem self-contained and some don't some obviously we we tried to end on cliffhangers but you want to try to give something that's satisfying in a in a storytelling sort of way so that it doesn't feel like oh here's a slice of bread and the family came home and they went on a picnic and then what happened and then you end the episode so you want to try to do something that's you know so that you it's not really three acts but it 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 gives you you know, character conflict and some sort of resolution. Yeah, we use the t term kind of differently in those two answers. Yeah, yeah um, it, it, and it's uh, essentially the same, I guess, is, uh, the, you know, your um, inciting incident, you know, what's the problem up front? Uh, where's that going to go? Oh, no, that's the end of Act 1. Uh-oh, that's... Not going to be good. Uh, 24. Yeah, about 24. We did three episodes of eight minutes each to make those 24. So we, re we the, each of them was an act of a standard sitcom. Whereas what Dennis is talking about is giving each of those segments its own beginning, middle, and end. And he used the term act to refer to those. So it was a little... Eight minutes of husbands. Uh, sorry, say that again? So each, each webisode is eight minutes of it. Each, each episode of Husbands was eight minutes, but they fit together to make a traditional episode of television. So the terminology gets very confusing, which is an episode and which is... And are they identified online as these three are an episode and then these... Are each, the, they're identified as these three episodes are a season, but in fact, that season is only 24 minutes of content. Oh, okay, so. thank you. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah. Oh, oh, do we have people with microphones? Yeah, we got ah. mics if you can please wait. Right. Thanks. So all of your series have wonderful famous people in, starring in them. I'm guessing came, to, came together because you had relationships with them before. And I'm curious, was there anyone that you asked to be in your web series that turned it down that or might have thought, well, I don't really want to do this, that 
kind of saw what the project was after it came out and kind of kicked themselves. Any stories about I bet you know, they the did. hard I don't sell? Know, I don't know if there's a name. I don't think people are going to be comfortable giving the names of the people who did that. <laughs> but yes, we definitely had that happen. Did anyone else? Yeah, no, we, I had, you know, I, we asked, well, actually I got lucky because Isai, you know, came aboard first. And then I asked Raymond Cruz, who gave me a really hard time. I mean, he's the sweetest guy. But he gave me a hard time in the beginning thinking, oh, I'm going to come work for this. You know, he's on Major Crimes, which is the big show on cable now. And, uh, but, you know, we, we asked some other people and, and they said, no, sorry, we can't do that. And then they saw it and then they liked it. So I don't know. I think, I think the inherent challenge to that philosophy is the fact that a lot of the agents want to bring an actor an offer. So when the money is not, you know, palatable, then they, um, they, they pass and have no idea. So sort of my way around that was to always meet with the actor and give him the, the, the pitch of what this is going to be and why this is important to him or her, why they couldn't pass up, you know, global exposure as an actor mm -hmm. and why that was worth it um, at the price point. And that usually was, you know, fell into our favor. But going right through the agent was, or the manager, forget it. That usually was, it would always stop there. Yeah, the, that we had that experience. Um, and we actually, everyone we actually sat down with uh, said yes. So, right. yeah. Right. We got a oh, just, yeah, where's the microphone? Hi. Uh, did, were all of these materials, and or you can also speak to other things that other projects in the past are you're currently working on that was intended for the web, or have you ever taken um, something that was for TV and converted it into a web uh, structure or feature length and converted it to web? Yeah, did, were any of these destined for elsewhere? Uh, ours wasn't. We, yeah, we wanted to create television for the web. I started. Uh, I wrote a short uh, for Burning Love, and then that became the whole series or the, the starting point for that. So yeah, it was always intended, I think, for the web. Mine wasn't my Robert Townsend came to me and said, please do this for us. And I did it. I, you know, this is, this is my first foray into it. And I, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And Anthony, yeah, years ago. Cybergen was always a, always a movie, movie online period. Yeah. I was wondering, um, over here, if, uh, if you guys could speak to uh, paperwork and contracts, like okay. what kind of paperwork did you have to fill out for the WGA and what kind of contracts did you need to do for SAG-AFTRA? Well, we had a line producer. Yeah. yeah. We took care yeah. of stuff. somebody else to think about those things. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm still signing contracts. For yes. <laughs> yeah. There, there are new media agreements. Um, and, I mean, it, for the most part, it's just the um, – the proper channels, you know, you register your work with the WGA and people get paid and, and um, you make sure everyone's taken care of and, and you don't tell anyone about the crates that you keep them in at night. <laughs> <laughs> so. And Brad became a WGA member through, through this process. So um, we, we, there was, again, more paperwork. So. <laughs> yeah, and you're right. There is stuff, like, even after you think you're done, like, it's like, oh, this never got signed. This never, and then you're, so you're doing stuff after the fact. Uh, Anthony, you mentioned instead of uh, going through the agents or managers, you met with the actors. How did you get to the actors? <sighs> That's the big question. Creating CSI. Of us like to know. In every medium. <laughs> no, I, no. I mean, truth be, I, th I, I think truth be told, you know, I think some people who watch the show want to would meet with me if I right. lobbed a call in and that kind of thing and. It wasn't really an end around. It was just like, you know, before you say no and, and not even, you know, because, again, I don't like to have anybody pitch anything that I'm doing through anybody else to somebody else because it always gets lost in the translation. It's some web thing, and then forget it, and they've already lost them. <laughs> so I, I just, you know, I just call them up and bring them in if they'll meet on a general meeting or meet specifically for the movie. So how do you get their number to call them up? Well, I mean, I usually use CA to, you know, make contact with them first, or I'll say, is it right. okay if I call them directly, or when they come in for a coffee? You know, nothing's going nothing's to happen bad if you just come have coffee with me, you know? Um, but once, once they get my evil clutches, <laughs> sell them to the day is long, and make sure you say yes. We do have some friends who are, are I mean, some actors who are our friends, so that's what I did. Like Tony Plan, I worked at Resurrection, so I said, come do this. And I didn't give him a choice. So he made the cameo. And then Lupe Ontiveros, I wrote it for her. And she gave me such a hard time because she wanted Elizabeth Pena's part in the Resurrection Boulevard. And she gave me such grief that I said, okay, well, I wrote this for you. 
you have to do it. <laughs> and then she had no choice. And then Raymond Cruz, I just, you know, I said, if I beat you on the golf course, you have to do it. <laughs> beat him, and he had to come do it. Well, that's a good point. I think that actors like to, while it's flattering, first of all, that you know something is written for you, but I think especially if you write something that plays against their type, you know, if you wrote, I don't know, a part for Paris Hilton where she played a scientist or something, <laughs> that might be very appealing to her. Or you take a Disney star who wants to break out of their um, their mold as the good girl, so you you know, write the part of a psychopath for her or something. Uh, that can definitely help uh, make it more appealing. And chances are, if you throw a rock, you'll hit somebody who knows somebody who was, you know, in high school with Gwyneth Paltrow or something. So you can always um, have the material ready and, and get it to them through contacts you might have that you can find if you get creative about looking looking for those paths. And that, yeah, writing against type, that was what we did for John Cryer, because we wanted, you know, it's like, oh, we've got a shot at John Cryer. Let's give him some material that's going to be something different than what he normally does. A sort of mm -hmm. smarmy interview guy wasn't wasn't really a color we'd seen on John Cryer. Well, so. and, and making Joss Whedon the voice of the, the Hollywood machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, over here on the left. Thank you. Um, I actually had a question about... Um, how you guys see Kickstarter and like other crowdsource funding, the pros and cons of that, how that's affecting web series. If you could share your thoughts on that. How many of us use Kickstarter? Was it just Brad? Yeah, can you speak to Kickstarter? Yeah, um, I think it's great. I don't think there are a lot of cons. I, I actually, even with as much money as you can raise, we raised um, 60,000 and that that you know was a huge um, huge help for us and and showed not only us and, and got us excited about making the content but showed um, the, anyone that we might be working with in the future who's interested in investing in the show that there are clearly people out there who not just want to watch the content but will spend money to see the content uh, which is something that certainly your advertisers or sponsors always want to see so it was a good proof of concept and I think maybe the only con that comes to mind is um, not being able to get enough money to make as much as you would want to make. You know, uh, we would love to make a full season um, of 24-minute uh, episodes like you would see on television. I think we could do that for 6 to $10 million. But if you tell the general public, hey, we need 6 to $10 million, it seems overwhelming. And, and then you're taking 6 to $10 million from people when, you know, there's certainly a company out there that could write you a check for that. That's more ideal. How much did you ask for? Uh, we asked for 50, and we got 60. Uh, 30 of that was in the first 12 hours. So, yeah, we had a huge response. All right. well, yeah, I guess so. Okay. Um, this goes back really to the first thing we were talking about, which was scale. Uh, and scale of uh, what watching on the web is. I tried to watch on the uh, laptop there. Um, rather than on screen, because if it's going to be mm -hmm. something on the internet, that's the way I'm going to be watching it. Uh, physically, I'm going to be about 18, 20 inches from it. If I'm watching television, I'm about 8, 10 feet from it. If I'm watching a movie, um, I'm a longer distance from it. And I think, or in my experience anyway, the closer I am to the screen, the, the, the less time I want to spend with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I can sit and watch Lawrence of Arabia, you know, for, for two and a half hours, um, watching it 18 inches from my face, the, the, the rhetoric's wonderful, but the, the better ones look like ants. And uh, the internet is now coming in literally different sizes physically. Are you guys developing a rhetoric based on the size of the image that, that your projected audience will watch? I think that, that size may be changing. Yeah. Of course, I mean, my television at home gets the internet, so I, I can watch any one of these shows or, or different shows yeah, on a 52-inch flat screen. Um, uh, yeah, like I said, I think television, like you're saying, will come in all different shapes and sizes. And the further back you are, generally the bigger the yeah, screen Let me gets. follow it up a little bit, because one of the things we learn about motion pictures is that it can move us through times and space, you know, literally from something happening a mile or two or, or, or several hundred yards down away from us moving towards the camera or away from it, keeping our interest. Almost everything I saw on this stuff, except I think for some stock shots, was from basically chest up or, or maybe you know down below somebody's knees. And that's that is television rhetoric, but that's 1950s television. And you know I'm hoping that that things get beyond. 
Well, I think for I think for Cybergeddon, I just kept telling the director, make sure you're shooting this thing for the iPhone only. That was just my simple like rule of thumb, just to make sure that he wasn't doing gorgeous masters that are this big on an iPhone, mm. and it really goes super tight all the time. I have I had a shirt made called Super Tight. <laughs> was it super tight? And I'd wear it and it goes, it's super tight, and it's very super tight. Um, Size was it? Only because, you know, it's very hard sometimes to make sure people, uh, the whole crew understands that we're not doing television. We're not doing movies. We're doing content specific to the devices. Mm -hmm. The pacing is different. The coloring is different. The, the dialogue is different. The storytelling is different. The shooting is different. It is all different. You know, um, because we're repurposing television or movies for the net is not really what we're doing. We're trying to reinvent it going forward. Yeah, you really do use different storytelling, where I think the rest of us probably are, are, are embracing traditional storytelling and assuming that this box will, will transform into the television. But you, you're sort of saying, like, this, because we're watching on a different device, we're watching it on a phone, maybe we have the phone on and we have the computer screen open and we have the TV on, you're sort of... Y you really are. A well, for Cybergeddon, we, we want to make sure that the, the pacing of the style was as every bit as frenetic as when you are online navigating. So it had to be mm -hmm. quick and fast, and we never really pitched a tent in that movie. It's like ding, 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 ding all the time. On mm -hmm. um, the rare occasion, you have a moment that was a moment we committed to in the script, mm -hmm. but for the most part, it just had to move like the wind all the way through because I'm so paranoid. <laughs> out. Right. Um, so we just want to make sure that the pacing and it look was different. I mean, Jerry Bruckheimer would walk by our editing bay and go, that looks like a TV show when he'd see CSI on the, on the Avid because it looked rich in color, this and that. I want people to watch Cybergeddon and say that's an, an online event that's different mm -hmm. than what I'm used to seeing. Well, that's very interesting. Well, mm -hmm. I try to, you know, I, I, I'm thinking that the Internet is going to become our television. Mm -hmm. And so I'm still, you know, I, I, don't, I know I don't look it, but I'm a little old school. I don't like to try to do, you know, because we're fighting. I'm trying to do like a serious drama. And then, you know, my competition is a, is a frickin' cat playing the piano. <laughs> so it's really hard to try to do something that, you know, has any sort of, you know, we're trying to convey emotion and trying to do all these things, and it's hard to do. There's a timing thing, and um, so, I, I, you know, I am sort of still trying to drag, like, you know, maybe a little more traditional uh, programming to the web because I think there's a space for it. Um, it's just going to be a little harder for you know, the, like you say, the people who just they don't have the ADD and they you know they want to go to the next thing. You know they're not going to listen to Lupe and Tavares. They cry for you know two minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I still want to do those other things and see if we can make that work and see because I think eventually the TV and the internet are going to be the same thing in all our homes. And we're just going to go home, and you're going to say, you want to see this, and that's it. And it'll just be like online everything, but it's your TV. Sure. And I think the ADD audience members are, um, I think for every one of those, you have somebody who will sit and, and wants to see a drama, wants to see something unfold. Um, and it's, it's all there. I mean, you know, you've got Mad Men, which I, I don't think with as compelling as it is, anyone would describe as frenetic. Uh, and then you've got, you know... Uh, yeah, CSI, which moves on to the next thing constantly. So I think that even in that medium and in all mediums, you've got fast-paced, you've got slow um, un unfolding stories. And I think there's a place for everything. Yeah, that's the The internet is very large. And <laughs> there's room for all different kinds of shows. And it may be the case that we'll see that one of these models will emerge as a winner, but it's more likely that all of these things will persist and, and find a place there. And it's interesting, you talked about competing against the cat videos. You know, the, all of these shows are now eligible for to be submitted for the Emmys. They go into a category called special program, live short form, live action, where this year the competition was series like this against the like webisodes that are made for shows like 30 Rock and Warehouse 13 that make their own webisodes and... Which I think is grossly unfair. Yeah, I do too. But you know what else was in our category? It was the Madonna halftime show from the Super Bowl. Was in that category too. So it's a bit of a I think if it airs on broadcast television, it should not be eligible for that. I don't know. But that's yeah. just my opinion, but... Well, they used to have the Cable Ace Awards for when it was like, well, cable shows can't compete against regular TV, and that sort of phased out, and now everybody gets an Emmy. So, uh, you know, do you want to be separated out, or do you want to be mainstreamed in? It's, it's sort of a cultural, social question. <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see where we go. Oh, but you've got you to play on a level playing field here, yeah. you know, 
I right. mean, it's just ridiculous to go up against an episode that yeah. was $3 million. Yeah, oh, I know. And up against Madonna, you could argue it's not the same thing. <laughs> well, you said earlier it was a really, really interesting point that no one's really cracked in this town, which is what keeps me up 24-7, which is what really goes viral in scripted, you know? Because, again, you, you sink money into a show, you get 20,000 views, you're like, where's, all, where's the audience at for the thing I just developed? And then something comes out, you know, Charlie bit my finger at a half billion, and you're like, what am I doing wrong here? <laughs> um, you know, you, you put a lot of money into something that nobody watches all day long, and then something just happenstance comes in and just catches fire. I think we're all trying to figure out, you know, how do we produce stuff that can run like the wind in terms of views? It's super, super challenging. I cannot figure that out yet. Apparently, we should have been dancing our way through South Korea because that was, <laughs> <laughs> seems to be oh, what's going right? like, yeah. kids are like, oh, 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 what is this thing? <laughs> it's, it's a huge, huge. video. Yeah. Like, unbelievable. <laughs> it's huge. Well, like, um, there was that video, Shit Girls Say. Did you see that? It was yeah. a viral video. It was scripted. Um, that was a collection of things that everyone who's ever known a girl has heard her say, like, you know, oh, hey, can you do me a favor? <laughs> or, you know, like digging through your purse or whatever it might be. Um, and I think that that is, um, that's the key. I think there's an inherent disadvantage with scripted because people want real, you know, that Charlie bit my finger is so cute because it was really this little kid that didn't know any better and it's a real thing. It's not scripted. Um, but when you script something that, has something relatable, it has a universal truth, and it has that element of, oh my God, that is so true. Debbie, you have to see this, you're just like this, don't you know, aren't you, you know. Um, plus the fact it had a guy in drag. And I think that that element, like, oh, guy in drag, that's funny. Oh, plus this is so true, has a, has a certain the guy in drag was one of the funniest Algorithm. things in Burning Love. So guy in drag may be the... Exactly. Solution. I mean, it's a classic. <laughs> Look at someone like it hot. Yeah. It's, it's worked for years. <laughs> Let's find another audience question. Back in um, the I, Hi. Thanks for this panel, by the way. It's fantastic. And I will say that Burning Love is the first time I've experienced appointment viewing. Like I would, I knew when it was it came out two, two times a week. Loved it. Yeah. So hilarious if you hadn't watched it. Um, my question, however, is about, uh, is if any of you have had any experience with uh, sponsorship uh, with your series, and would you consider product integration, and to what degree? Anthony, you're all over sponsorship. Yeah, we did do that. Um, you know, working at CSI with GM and Duracell, big, big pains in the ass. Um, it was really, really tough for those guys. Uh, it was like, you know, oh, the battery goes go this way and this way. Gary Sneese's finger is crossing the D, so it's Uracell. Um, so for, for Norton, we sat down, we, we went to Symantec and said, look, we have this, we have this pitch of a movie, of interactive experience, of extra content, of an app. It was a full experience, 24-7, you know. Um, and they bought into it because obviously a cybercrime company like themselves, they sell software, and a cybercrime movie makes perfect sense. It's on brand for me and CSI, this and that. Um, and I just had the conversation up front. I was like, look, you're not writing the script. I'm not designing the software. Let's just get that out of the way right now, okay? <laughs> so here's the thing. Like, I'm gonna do what I do. You're gonna cut the check. You're gonna do what you do, go sell out of software. You're gonna help us authenticate our script, you know, cyber crime wise, because you, you have all the experts, which we'll utilize. You know, tell us what you'd like to have. And we just had very, very frank conversations back and forth. So we didn't get into this dance of like, you know, whining and like, oh, where'd our money go? And you're not featuring us properly. Because again, you could over feature a company in your movie to the point where it just pisses your audience off. And you get nailed in the press for doing an infomercial. So you got to do enough to go, there's your thing, but not so much to where it's just embarrassing. And you have to tell them up front. I think if you manage your expectations early, I think it was a pretty smooth experience. I read a review, a rave review of Cy Cybergen, which uh, had the criticism that they felt that the sponsorship was a little too... Uh, too in sync with the content. And, and I thought, well, that's a note I've never heard before. Your sponsorship is on the nose. <laughs> like, I, <laughs> I, I, it's like E.T., Reese's Pieces and E.T. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think it's a, um, a, yeah, probably well, a perfect combination. Well, the thing is, look, you know, there's a need. First rule in screenwriting, right? I read that book. It was like, what does the character need? Like, we need to, uh, companies need to be able to go non-traditionally outside of commercial and figure out a way to put their money somewhere else besides commercials that you just TiVo and just you know whiz through, which is a disaster for them. Right. When you think about CSI at its height was eight hundred fifty-seven thousand dollars for a thirty-second spot. If Norton put in that wow. much money for the movie, that would have a shelf life of twenty, thirty years. 
right. all through every territory and Yahoo and DVD and VOD and iTunes and foreign territory. It just never would, ever, it would end in terms of where their money goes versus just one spot here and gone tomorrow. It's a complete waste of money in my opinion. So when you were when you were selling it to Norton, did you say oh, we expect this many views or this much engagement or just how how do you they weren't really hung up on views so much that they just wanted to have the exposure to tap into a different market in a different way, you know how do you sell a Norton? You just do right. funny commercials that at so much money per thirty seconds, or find a way to really expand globally and get people to you know so we put some some small edutainment in the movie, mm -hmm. but don't use password for password, not a good idea. Do your <laughs> updates, things like that, just enough to throw a fastball to them. And by the way, I feature stuff really on the nose on purpose so I had something to show the next the next brand is here's how we feature companies in these movies which is a smart business play and I've got to go home now and change my password question back here uh, hi, hi. Um, I, uh, my name is Gregory. I wrote a web series that got uh, nominated for a Writers Guild uh, Award last year. And I'm at the stage, and, and I have another one that I'm about to go to New York and do a premiere at the New York Television Festival. And I'm at nice. the stage where I want to know where we are in terms of money and, you know, making money and then also how to best market. Because one thing that it seems to be lacking in the web space is people are like, oh, I'm gonna tweet about it. Like, or I'm gonna create a Facebook you know, page. And okay, that's great. You're gonna reach maybe 1,000 people, maybe, maybe 10,000 if you're lucky. Uh, but the movie industry and TV still spends a ton of money on their promos and the marketing, and they have a huge department. So I wanna know sort of what your takes are on how to get past the sort of friends and family idea of marketing, and then also what your takes are on making money. I mean, I know, Anthony, you said that you're just going to, you know, money be damned at this point, but I think, by the way, I think it's great that you're in it because you could say, uh, because you're saying money be damned and you're going to find how to make the money. I'm, I'm trying to go away the same route and do a $700 CPM, which I think any of us can do by making your series a nap. It's just that easy. But anyway, um, what is, what's your take on how to make the money and the marketing in order to make that money? And that's, I guess, yeah. Well, for me, I, for me, I just, just want to be as pure as an artist, artist as possible. I just want to write what I want to write. That, that just, that's just the long and short of it for me. So the thing is, in terms of, there's not, a lot, there's not big money in it right now because it's so new. My position is just we're just just trying to just change behaviors because that's where it's going and we're super ahead of our time and people just don't really watch stuff on Yahoo right now but they're beginning to do more and more of that because of this young lady's amazing series that's hilarious you know and maybe my movie inspires some people or you know diff different shows but the thing is you're right beyond friends and family it's tough to market we're having the same issue with, with Yahoo who controls 700 million people and it's hard to still get some traction and we're on a Yahoo planet. That's why I signed up with Yahoo. You have a planet of 700 million people that you control. We're going to make a movie that you guys are invested in. Now tell the people on your planet to watch it. Please do that. So the thing, if you don't have the power of that behind and beyond friends and family, it's very, very tough. We should have put the money for the app into the marketing. We should have put a, you know, that kind of money into marketing, and that would have really helped sort of sustain beyond the launch. Because once you launch, if it doesn't catch, it just sits and dies. That's the problem. But the, the, but the, the key thing for, for what you're doing is, we're all doing, the, the, the win is in the doing. That's really, really key because you know what? You don't really need marketing if it's just really, really good and special and people find it and want to share it. The, the, the marketing will be a click of a button and you'll be sharing with, with, with people beyond your friends and family. It just has to be really that good and it'll catch. I completely agree. I think that um, especially creators, because they, they are more interested in, um, in creating and, and what the story they want to tell, uh, and then you get so excited when you might get a deal or a sponsor coming along and spending money that you want to spend all of that money on what goes on the screen or uh, everything that you might need when, you know, I think it's, what is it, whatever you spend on on the budget to actually make it, spend twice as much on marketing as the formula. Uh, and I think that you should always, always, always budget for marketing. Have a plan. Have um, uh, an idea of what the angle is that you're going to take when you're making it. Like you were saying, uh, Yahoo sort of advertised your show like it was a real reality show. Uh, and that is great because it catches attention. You know, it's the reason that um, every scary movie was inspired by true events. Because it's, oh, well, if it's true. 
uh, and, and consider that. Consider your marketing angle when you're writing the script because that might inform how you're going to write the script. And, and it doesn't necessarily need to be in a um, tactic-y, you know, ploy <laughs> kind of a way. Um, but I think that that in combination with creating compelling content, like you were saying, content that's just going to catch, you know, uh, we created Husbands. There was no show about marriage equality or two men getting married and being the central story that, that didn't exist. And it's it's a topical subject that is on a lot of people's minds and resonates with uh, an emotional layer that exists already. And all we're doing is tapping into that. So by doing that, the content is compelling and people are driven to share it. There are other things too that you can do. I mean, um, we were fortunate enough to, and Richard Cummings is here from, from um, V Studios. Uh, he had the, br the brilliant idea of uh, transit TV, which is on the buses, they have monitors. So Richard went to transit TV and he said, we have this little show that you, your people who ride the bus might like this thing. So he showed it to them, and normally you have to bring a sponsor with your show, but they liked Los Americans so much that they said, hey, we'll, we'll put it on there. So they had me cut it into little five-minute bits, and you could watch a scene or two and, while you're riding the bus, and we had 30 million views a month. So it was, that's pretty credi incredible. So uh, there are other things out there, you know, if you're creative enough, you know, you should talk to Richard. He, 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 he might have some more ideas. <laughs> I'm wondering, though, did the 30 million views turn into money where it's subsidizing or sustaining you to make more seasons? Well, they don't turn into money necessarily because <laughs> there is really no way to monetize this. I mean, unless you get a big sponsor. Um, you know, we, we did, it did look like um, PBS was going to come aboard one time. We were going to go to PBS. Um, and then that didn't work out, and it looked like uh, AT and T was going to sponsor us when they thought they needed the Latinos before they, when they were going to merge. Remember when they were going to buy, um, uh, yeah, T-Mobile. They were, but then when the, when the FCC told them no, then all of a sudden they lost interest. Uh, they only they didn't need the Latinos anymore. So uh, you know, like it's that kind of deal. But you know, I wish I could tell you how to monetize your thing. But if, you know, if I knew that, then there would be 100 episodes of Los American. <laughs> we have another question. Oh, I think it's, it's I me. I think it's you. Hi. My name is Amy, and I write for the web series Awkward Black Girl. And um, I know that web series was born of a desire to have diversity, something that we didn't see on television coming to the web. And I feel like that's a similar story for a lot of you in your web series. And I'd love to hear a little bit more of that spark that origin, like when did you, Jane, start talking to Cheeks about like how this should be an idea and where mm -hmm. that spark came from? And I know you said that you loved reality TV, so I'd love to hear origin stories. Yeah, but yeah. Brad, you should tell our origin story since you're on the panel. Mm, just, it just all honored. began long ago. <laughs> uh, on Twitter, actually, um, well, you had seen a YouTube video that I'd yeah, done. Yeah, you, you did a YouTube video about marriage equality um, that that sparked my interest, but it wasn't till a couple years later that you that we were like, this needs to be a show. Yeah, yeah. and and I'd wanted to develop something um, online, and then we came up with this idea, and it uh, just made more sense that this should go online anyway, because we knew that um, networks would say you can't put gay people on television, <laughs> um, and uh, that was that was kind of the response we got. And then they turned around and put gay people on television, which is great because there should be more gay people on television. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it was it was absolutely like let's let's put it here, and not only because we'll get to do what we want to do, but to prove that there is an audience. Yes, people will watch this. People will like it. And no, not just gay people. <laughs> yeah, and the the. There's more complexity that I realized in diversity than I realized before that it's not just, oh, let's get gay people on TV, but it's certain what kinds of gay people are acceptable on TV. Uh, and so there's, there's, there are issues within issues. Uh, Erica and Dennis, did you want to speak to? Sure. Um, since we are referencing these reality dating shows, we actually comment on the lack of diversity. So... The sort of exotic character in our show is Ken Jong in a wig, um, but yeah, so that's that's our touch on diversity. And he was kicked out 
early. The other girls Tell voted me. voted her out, and then she yeah. comes back later. Yeah. That was hilarious. Yeah. Well, Los Americans obviously is all about diversity, and um, and Resurrection Boulevard too was really you know we really tried to include everybody. I mean, we did a lot of African Americans, you know, and all a lot of the fighters, and we had you know made a point of all of that so you know but yeah you you do get that because then some people are complaining that wait a minute he's a light-skinned latino or mm -hmm. he's a dark-skinned yeah. latino or he's a light-skinned per uh, black man or he's a dark skin and you know it's like you know after a point you just want to blow your brains out because <laughs> you know you're trying to do the right thing right. and it just you, you know let no good deed go unpunished <laughs> so you know it's it's a two-edged sword and Anthony, you have a female-centered action piece. Did you feel that that was something that was better suited for the web than that there'd be resistance on TV? Yeah, cybergeneration was just always, you know, we went to Washington, D.C., did a lot of research and talked, you know, what was sort of the next crime thing, you know, based on forensics, and they said cybercrime, and that was, and they scared us to death for three days, and I was thinking, oh, everybody on Facebook is not who they are, and, <laughs> and everybody's <laughs> grooming me and knowing my information, and I, I just, like, Got rid of like half the friends in one night over like drinks. Like, no, 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 no. You're not my mother. You know? Um, but I always knew that, you know, I, I, you know, I wrote a, a pilot called Cybercrime for CBS and it didn't, didn't go and I was like, okay. Uh, and I was like, you know what, I'm, I'm done with that. I'm, I just, we're gonna do a cybercrime thing anyway. And so we just, uh, I sat down with Dolphin and they were like, do the biggest thing possible, but tell a small story. Yeah. And I was like, great, Cybergeddon. So I just took Cybercrime and Armageddon, Bruckheimer thought, was sandwiched it together, it was born. <laughs> Cybergeddon. Like Sharktopus. <laughs> <laughs> you said that, not me. <laughs> Do we have another question? Yes. Or, or I guess, where's the microphone? Stand Microphone's by. coming to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question. Have any of you ever have any of you ever considered, for example, like not partnering with an entity like Yahoo and just setting up your own kind of production online and asking people to use some sort of subscription model to pay? Like, it doesn't matter that you have a Yahoo behind you or you know these bigger entities. Does it help, or is it better just to be? I mean, Brad, you were a YouTube personality before you did this, so you were kind of a standalone entity. Did you find that that was a little bit a better way to monetize your work? Does, was there, were there, did you get more exposure and more kind of um, developing your own world as a content creator in that, in that way? Mm -hmm. um, it, I actually did what you're saying um, uh, and did not monetize it. Uh, we're exclusively on YouTube right now. We super syndicated um, our first season like Roku and Boxy and um, yeah I've I've been a partner on YouTube since 2008 but I've never opted in for ad share or anything uh, because at this point it it would interrupt the relationship with the audience and I'm more interested in cultivating that relationship because uh, growing those numbers growing that fan base and really energizing them and connecting with them and earning their trust that you will provide good content and that what you do is for them first uh, will be much more beneficial and, and give me a lot more power when going to a sponsor or an advertiser and saying, look, I'm going to do this the way I know how to do it and you're going to give me money to do it and this will be beneficial for the both of us um, because I've, I've proven that I know what I'm doing. And, and how to deliver something where people give us $30,000 in 12 hours. So um, initially what I wanted to do was come up with my own video player platform, but that's, you know, 50 grand. Uh, and keeping something exclusively on YouTube means that more people will see it because of tagging um, and people are more likely to share a YouTube link because they trust it. They're constantly going to YouTube. They know that, you know, it's not some crazy spam or something. Um, so yeah, I did that actually as an effort to to build that relationship with my audience and not um, monetize at this point. But it's an investment in monetiza monetization, I guess is what I should say. Right, because then you have the base to go on Kickstarter and, and be able to raise the kind of money that, exactly. that you did, which exactly. is amazing. I think building your own thing and charging is really tough. I think pulling out a credit card to do anything online, unless you really want to buy it, it's very, very tough to ask someone to do that for content. Um, 
that said, I, I, I think that Brad's doing it the right way. I mean, it's very, very smart to just say, hey, you first, you know, cultivate trust and grow is a very, very smart approach. Because when that really begins to really pop, you know, that audience will be there. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm in a different situation where, you know, we're relying on CSI people like, hey, what's Anthony doing next, which means something or nothing at, at this point. But we're, we're doing, we're playing a numbers game with, the, with Yahoo, which is, give, you know, give us a, a great scale head start and see if they come. Um, but if I had my druthers to do it right, it would be Brad's way. I think Brad's way is the best way, which is like, you know, viewer by viewer, trust, intimate, and just build. And that, that's, the, that's the right way to do it, I think. Cool. We have a question over yeah. here. Yeah. Is, it, uh, is it possible to sell a web pilot, or do you need to bring people an entire series in terms of saying, or do you have any interest in sponsoring this? I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the uh, logistics of the financing model are if you're some poor schlub who put a short together and thought this should be on the web and didn't really have a business plan after that. It's sort of what we did with husband. We used husband seasons one, season one, as a pilot to show the people on Kickstarter, like this is what the show looks like, and then use that to raise the money. So we did sort of do that. We did that also. Yeah. We shot a sizzle reel on sort of a budget, uh, and then basically a year later, we got the funding for the whole series. So and did you take idea. it around and shop it, or did you have agents do that for you? I'm, I'm sort of really getting inside baseball at this point, but what was the process you went through after you had developed the content, and then you went, all right, now what the heck do I do? We had already um, aligned with Red Hour, which is Ben Stiller's company, so we had a production company behind us, but then they helped us figure everything else out. And you don't actually need to, I mean... If you have the means to to make that first bit yourself, to make the bit of pilot film that you will then use, then the Kickstarter is the is your studio in a way. That's where you get your money. So you don't really need to take it out and shop it anywhere other than to the public if if you want to go with that model. Hi. Um, Hi. Can, can any of you be more specific about your budgets? I mean, I know, Brad, you used Kickstarter, but... Can you be more specific about what your budgets were? No. I know Anthony doesn't want to. <laughs> well, I, I would I would be comfortable saying that uh, we spent about half of what, a little less than half of what one cast member of Modern Family makes per episode. <laughs> <laughs> our, our, <laughs> our director, Jeff Greenstein, worked on uh, Desperate Housewives, and he liked to say that we shot all of husbands for what the water bottled water budget is on Desperate Housewives. Um, so, it, it, but it, it's cheap, but it's not cheap, but I don't think anyone feels comfortable getting into, into numbers. Ballpark? <laughs> Ballpark. Well, I would... Dodger I, Stadium. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, good I, answer. I at least matched the Kickstarter. The Kickstarter was, was half or less of what we spent on season two. Is a world of non-union crews that you guys went to that do webisodes, or did you just put this together? From Boy, budget and unions. It is time to wrap up because uh, the, these are the questions where, where, that people may not be entirely comfortable asking. We had a we had a union crew, um, and uh, but I think there probably is a world of non-union crews out there. A union for the non-union. <laughs> Unionless union. <laughs> but you actually had casting directors and all of that stuff also. Uh, no, we cast it ourselves, so maybe that's bad. Maybe, see, we really shouldn't be talking about this. <laughs> there is a certain amount of pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps, and your bootstraps are just made out of scotch tape you bought yourself. So uh, uh, some things you go unions, you know, you do the best you can to try to make take care of your crew and make sure that the crew, you know, is is happy and rested and fed, and uh, you do your best to make sure they're also union. I will say one thing with this gentleman said over here, which is really interesting, which is uh, I do believe this, the quickest route to get something going probably is the Kickstarter route in terms of raising funds. But I, I feel in my heart of hearts that the networks and the studios are going to be scrambling to snap up online content that, that we put together that's quick in terms of you know, trying to uh, acquiesce and, and, and get that stuff onto the networks because they're such great, clever ideas. What? I think that'll be, the, that'll be no. the, graphic, the graphic novel of the future will be our little web content that we're going to snap up and make a series. There was an article just today of two web series. They said web series, so I'm going to repeat the word even though I think it's, it's outre. But uh, from, from 2006 and 2007 or something, somebody, CW, I don't know. I, I shouldn't... You mean like Dr. Horrible. 
Well, they aired Dr. Airing. Horrible, yeah. but there was something about acquiring some property. I'll have to go back and look at it. I, I skimmed the article because I was looking for the mention of husbands because there was a mention in there. So I was like, what? Something, 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 my name. So. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, yeah, start, start following the news articles about this as uh, if you guys are going to start developing your own web content because the stuff is changing daily. And uh, pretty much everything we told you tonight is obsolete right now because it changed that fast while we were saying it. So I want to thank our panel, Anthony and Erica and Brad and Dennis. <laughs> and... Before we go, I want us all to say the link that you should go to to watch the material. So where should people go to see Cybergeddon? Uh, Yahoo. Okay. Lovehusbands.com. Where's Burning Love? Burninglove.com. Really Losamericans.com. <laughs> and it's not Los Americanos. Okay, Los Americans. So watch, watch your typing. All right, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night.